Hello and welcome to the New America Book Club. It is that intimate. Thank you all for braving <laughs> the snow. I really yeah. appreciate it. It's a heck of a day and the cold. Uh, I'm Foz Hogan, filling in for Andres Martinez, who is stuck in an airport somewhere in a warmer climate, uh, unable to get back. He sends his apologies. Um, I am the managing editor here at New America, which requires me to make a plug for our weekly digital magazine, The Weekly Wonk, weeklywonk.org. Please check it out. Great works by people. Some tastes like Megan. Uh, we're talking to Megan McArdle about her new book, The Upside of Down, Why Failing is the Key to Success. If you're live streaming our, this event, uh, feel free to tweet at us at New America or at Megan's handle, asymmetric info. And I'm gonna hit just a few points and then I'm gonna treat it probably like a book club and let you all ask a lot of questions. We'll keep it, uh, we'll end at our regular time. But I had a, pithy opening question for Megan, and then she told me she had a really good story relating to why she was late and how it relates to the thesis of the book. So I'm going to let her do that. Um, yeah, so I hate driving into downtown DC. I live uh, about a mile and a quarter due north of the capital, which doesn't have sort of great transportation op options. But I hate driving into downtown DC because it's so hard to park here. Luckily, my mother is retired and does not mind ferrying me around. She lives uh, just a few blocks from me over in Trinidad. Uh, at 11.30, I got a phone call from my mother uh, explaining somewhat agitatedly that her garage door opener is broken and neither she nor the tenant who lives in her basement can get out. Um, luckily, I had a backup plan. We have this great service in DC called Uber. Uber is wonderful. You just go on your smartphone, you ask for a car, a car shows up. Um, so I, at 11.42, I punch in, bring me an Uber. Uh, it tells me a car is eight minutes away, plenty of time to get here. Um, so at like 11.52, I check the Uber app because uh, he hasn't arrived yet. And I see that he has somehow left Noma near my house and is now in Southeast DC. <laughs> <laughs> and I try to call him and no one answers. And then finally, he calls and says, yeah, I'm in Southeast DC. I, don't even I didn't even get to why. <laughs> and there's traffic congestion. So I frantically go run to my husband and say, you have to drive me to New America right now. Um, and he says, OK, OK. He gets up, he puts his shoes on. And we go out, and of course, it has snowed. So we need to clear the car off. We need to de-ice it. Um, and we start driving. But it's only it's 12 o'clock. It's, it's only like a 12-minute cab ride from my house to here. I've done it before when I was a Bernard Schwartz fellow here. Unfortunately, the snow has caused everyone in DC to act like complete maniacs, or actually like the opposite of complete maniacs, right? They're now driving two miles an hour down the road. So um, at 12.07, I called New America and explained that there was no way I was actually going to arrive on time because we were following a, pon a Pontiac that seemed to think that the main property of snow was that your car could actually only go one mile an hour in it. Um, and the reason this is interesting is that it's actually a really interesting example of something um, that James Reason calls normal accident theory. So he actually illustrates it with a similar example of needing to get out of your house and your car isn't working, so you go to your neighbor, but your neighbor can't lend you his car today, so you call a taxi, so you, you're gonna take the bus, but there's a bus strike, and then you try to call a taxi, but because there's a bus strike, all the taxis, right? These things cascade. And they cascade because in a complicated world, you have all of these layers of uh, what I come to think of as spell check factor, right? You have all of these things that are backup. Antibiotics are a great example of spell check factor. So we can kill bacteria. Things are no, no longer nearly as fatal as they were, and that's great. That is great news. Um, for example, pneumonia, basically if you got pneumonia over the age of 60, it used to be fatal. They used to call it actually the old man's friend because it was a comparatively nice way to die compared to whatever else could carry you off. Um, however, now that doesn't happen, and so people, when you see cancer statistics rising and so forth, that's because we, we no longer die of pneumonia, and that's great news, but because people no longer die of pneumonia, people aren't as careful about washing their hands when they touch sick people, so we introduce more infections. Similarly, um, with this spell check factor, right, I didn't, I, I was basically set to leave the house half an hour before, which was plenty of time, but had I not had all of these backups, all of which then cascadingly failed, I might have made it an hour. You change your behavior when you have spell check factor. We like to think that we can engineer failure completely out of the system. That when failures happen, it's because someone hasn't planned well enough. Someone, But in fact, in normal operation, you're not going to leave an hour buffer if it's supposed to take you 15 minutes. And if you have seven backups, that's, you know, as, as one of my professors used to say, if you have never missed a flight, you're spending too much time sitting in airports. 
I'm not sure I actually agree with that specific example because I've never missed a flight. But, um, but in general, you know, buffer has cost. And so we tend to try to minimize it over time. And the more things that we engineer away, the more we actually can introduce other issues. So for, uh, Sam Peltzman famously proposed that if we really wanted people to, if we really wanted to get rid of car accidents, we should just mount a spear in the middle of the uh, steering wheel pointed directly at your heart and everyone would drive really, really carefully. Because uh, we do see that with seat belts and anti-lock brakes or so forth, drivers actually compensate. They then, you have anti-lock brakes and so you drive faster. Um, and you get yourself into more risky situations and you lose some of the safety benefit of that spell check factor um, to failures. So this is one of the many reasons that as I write in the book, Failure is inevitable. It's not something that merely happens when you don't plan well enough. It's something that happens because it is inherent in a complicated world where you cannot predict every eventuality that sometimes things are going to fail. And you may not want to miss flights, but in general, if you've never failed, you've spent too much time sitting on the sidelines. Um, and so I will close with that. And yeah, it's right. <laughs> mass transit, I always often say with mass transit, it's going to be yes. on time every time. You're going to end up being early, very most early, of most of the time, because you have to for all the risk. So that's great. That's a thesis. Uh, the other moment uh, I was going to first set up is the moment when you knew you had a book, right? But keep it in Facebook post length. Um, so there were two real contributors to the book, and the first was that um, I uh, I failed my way into journalism completely. I was supposed to be a management consultant, and when that didn't work out, I, I makes us journalists feel great. <laughs> that we're the we're the we're the, the, the down bucket. No, it, it actually, it's, it's sort of the opposite. Journalism is so risky. It's so hard to get ahead, and it doesn't pay that well. But mostly it's so, you know, I would have business school classmates who would come up and say, you know, I'm having trouble. I'm thinking about getting into journalism. I was like, okay, just be prepared. It's way more competitive than banking or consulting. And they would freak out. Um, but I really wanted to do it. I really loved writing about economics and public policy. And after two years of not finding a safe job, I wanted to be a writer since I was eight. I decided to be a writer at the age of eight and then gave it up to be safe. I finally was just like, well, clearly safe isn't working out. Let's try risky. Um, and risky has worked out a lot better for me, actually. So it's your own personal story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, last bit of setup, then I'll go to some basic points here. Uh, what's the weirdest piece of feedback you've gotten so far? Um, I don't know if it's weird. Like, you never know what book you've written right. until someone else reads it. Um, there were a couple of things where people had just clearly misremembered something that I'd written, and I was like, and I was totally puzzled and looking it up, and then I sort of found that. Uh, but the, I think the the thing that has surprised me maybe the most was that there were a number of people who were like, I was expecting 12 easy steps to fix my life, and this is not that book. And I was like, I don't think I said this was that book. <laughs> Thought of it. Um, I mean, there is actually a fair amount of 12 easy steps to fix right. your life, but it's, you know, it's a mixture of of research and and sort of reporting and memoir. Um, and it's a meditation on failure, in part because the, the surprising thing to me about writing this was actually how effective just stating that failure is not only an option, but definitely going to happen. It's almost like a marketing treatise for failure. Like, failure's okay, yes. folks. You don't, <laughs> well, right. but just that how changing the way you think about it, right. and like not with some series of really advanced exercises, but merely just saying, oh, right, yeah, no, of course I'm going to fail. That's going to happen actually really, really does change both your willingness to take risks and how well you're able to handle them after they happen. All right, so a few big points. Uh, one, how do we distinguish mistakes, like garden variety mistakes, from failure? How do I know if right. I made a heroic failure I should learn from or I'm just a screw up? So th the difference between a mistake and a failure is the outcome. And I think that we often, we should focus more on mistakes and less on, on, on failure. We should look more at the process and less on the outcome. And washing your hands is a really good example. You know, sometimes in a hospital, a doctor can do everything right and the patient will die just because they're really sick, right? And we're not, no one, I, I hate to tell you this, but no one here is going to live forever. Apologies. Um, so sometimes a doctor can do everything right and someone will die, and sometimes they can do everything wrong and the patient will live. Um, and actually, so in the book, I actually chronicle watching series of mistakes after mistake being made on my mother whose appendix had burst, which is a, not a big deal when you're 20, but is really a big deal when you're 70. Um, and it didn't matter because the antibiotics that they pumped into her saved her. Uh, but the mistakes still mattered a lot because one in some number of times, that's going to kill a patient. And unfortunately, the way that we handle medical error is much more likely often to focus. You think about the liability system, right? When do you sue when something has gone wrong? Not when someone did something wrong, but when they had a bad outcome. 
And so you get with liability two kinds of bad outcomes. Sometimes people who didn't do anything wrong have to pay a lot of money. And then sometimes, a lot of times, people who had something terrible happen don't get reimbursed. Like an, it's an execution error versus a system error. Yeah. Like well, we it's, it's a system. We don't need to fix a system. We yeah. should be better at working what, the system. What we want to look at is, is are we doing it right? Are we, do, are we following a good process not to we get a good outcome? Because right. outcomes are not, in a complex system, a very good measurement right. of, of um, whether you actually did the right thing. Last question on that point is, could the response to your book thesis, if I had a thin understanding of your book, so I want you to respond to this thing. I keep not winning the lottery. Should I just keep trying and trying no. again? Right? <laughs> I, mean, I keep failing doing the lottery. So how do you know when you're just a bonehead? Right. Right. So you want to take calculated risks and not, um, and not just like put everything on red, right? This is not about betting the farm on things that are very, very unlikely to pay off. And with the lottery especially, like it's math. You know that, you're, that the expected value is negative. Um, so how do you take calculated risks? I mean, one of the really important things, I think, uh, there's a great analogy. G.K. Uh, Chesterton wrote a great thing on uh, social reformers. He calls it, talks about a fence. A guy comes to a fence in the middle of the road and says, this fence is stupid, we should take it down. Um, there's no reason for it to be here. And he says that person should never be allowed to touch the fence because the fence didn't just grow there, right? Someone put it there for a reason. And if you can tell me what that reason was, then you're in a position to say, okay, well, that reason doesn't apply anymore. Or we can do something better to serve that purpose. Um, but if you just think that it's stupid, then probably what it is is that you don't, you're stupid and you don't understand the purpose. And so similarly with failure, um, if you can't explain why you failed, you should not do that thing again. <laughs> because you need, to be, you need to be able to explain why it didn't work this time and why it's more likely to work next time. Um, and so, you know, oh, it's, that's, okay. yeah, it's, a, it's an understanding of the failure. Yeah. If you, if you can tell me that something is, so with a business. I can explain my lottery ticket purchase. It's just yeah. a dumb purchase start to finish. Yeah, if right. you, I can explain why it didn't work, which right. is that you had a very, 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 very low choice right. chance of, of winning, and so you shouldn't do that. Right. Um, but if you could explain to me, like, I was one number off, and I know what the next number <laughs> is, and like, okay, yeah, if you know right. what the next number is, then go. Um, uh, similarly, uh, how do you know, it's the second big point that comes across in the book, is how do you know when you're just part of a broad end set Right, and that this is just an episodic failure that the system is still right, or how do you know when you're suddenly in a fork in the road? The, the, the example I think of is general managers of, of a sports team. How do they know when the kid they spend a lot of money on, or not, right, is having a bad April, or is he a bad player? Like, how do you? That's always, I mean, that is always going to be art as well as science. I right. wish there were like one way to say it, but I mean, the, my general. Um, answer to this is that we tend to focus on people and specific people way too much. We tend to focus on um, less on systemic outcomes. You know, there's something a uh, psychologist called the fundamental attribution error, right. where when someone comes up to you, when the checking lady, checkout lady at the supermarket is rude to you, you think, oh wow, she must be a rude, horrible person. Not like, you know, I bet her mother died three weeks ago and she's just feeling rotten. Um, or she had, or something happened. You tend to attribute it to the characteristics of the person rather than to the situation that they're in. Um, and we do this more broadly. You know, when, when something goes wrong, there's something I uh, called, I did not coin this, but blame storming, which is just like brainstorming, except we all get together and, and try <laughs> to figure out who did this to us. Um, and the reason, you know, sometimes it's true, right? Like Bertie Madoff actually did completely hose um, the people who invested with him, and it was all his fault. I mean, except for the other people who helped him do it, right? right? It was their fault. And the credulity of the investors also sort of argue, argue there's some share. Of yeah, and I actually really would argue twelve percent every single year. I, I do right. argue that actually with the investors, one of the issues was it was funny. It wasn't exactly that they were greedy because they what they were getting was not particularly high returns, but they were perfectly safe returns every year. You got twelve percent. The market was up, you got 12%. The market was down, the market did nothing, you got 12%. You, you should be suspicious he's taking a big, even if you're, even right. if he's getting 18, like, I want somebody that extra 6%, right? Yeah. yeah, you should be suspicious when it's right. that even, right? right? But people thought of themselves as being prudent. And so a lot of people kind of wheedled their way in to these funds, which is really sad, um, and destroyed themselves. But so even there, yes, there's always, it, it does take, you have to help a con man con you. It is very, uh, very unusual that you're the, there's a reason that con, con men tend to rely on people trying to get something for nothing. Um, Sorry, back to the system. Yeah, but, yeah. but in a lot of cases, you know, we look for, when you look at the financial crisis, how much of it focused on banksters, right? And not that they didn't richly deserve to be yelled at and, and so forth. Um, 
But when I talked to these guys, I did not hear people say before the financial crisis, this is great because the Fed's just going to bail us out and we don't care if we lose a bunch of money for everyone else. What you heard was this actually the same thing you heard from homeowners and the same thing that I heard from regulators, which is we are so much smarter than we used to be that this isn't even risky. Oh, but Michael Lewis posit there was some of that thing that you just said didn't happen, there, right? There was some of the notion that there was they're some, not going to let, they're really not going to come on. There was a, there so some uh, fundamental value. Yes, on the, the bedrock, the after, government support. After right. 2008, there was, right. absolutely. After the, after the bailouts, there started to be that, and I think you, but it's marginal. I mean, the real problem is that everyone took these huge bets that were really dumb. Right. Um, and, and even there, it's more, as one guy put it to me, you know, if you discussed these scenarios, people would say, well, if that happens, the entire U.S. economy melts down and who cares, right? Like that the scenario was so bad that it's sort of like trying to hedge against an asteroid hitting the Earth and destroying all human life. I mean, that would be very bad for my portfolio, but I'm not spending a lot of time trying to insure against that. And there's actually a lot of talk about this in financial markets is if the U.S. goes down, it's sort of buying reinsurance is pointless. <laughs> Because every yeah. all of the financial companies will go down too, and that was the scenario. In some ways, they imagined it to be too bad. They didn't insure against it because they kind of imagined that right. everything would blow up so so thoroughly that we would just all be like the guns casting. Yeah, goals. exactly. Right. Can guns, can yeah. goods, and ammunition would right. be the. Um, no, it's not that there wasn't some of that, but the core problem was not that. The core problem was total stupidity. Total stupidity on the part of the Fed, and the SEC, and all these other guys who, not because they were misled by deregulators, because they really thought they were geniuses. There was a whole theory called the Great Moderation that like whole academic careers were built on, and this was the theory that it was not possible to have a financial crisis anymore of any note, that inflation was low, that you know, recessions were very, compared to earlier ones, were very moderate, um, and that this reflected genius on the part of the regulators, that our economic theory and our computers and the regulations were so much better that it wasn't. So you would talk to, bankers about the housing crisis, about the housing bubble, and they would say, yes, this could go bad, but that would take a sustained nationwide decline in housing prices, and that hasn't happened since the Great Depression. And behind that was kind of this implicit assumption that the Great Depression was off the table. And that was something that I heard from homeowners who all thought that they had found a sure thing, right? Like, buy the biggest house you can afford because that's how you retire. And we can put in um, granite countertops in a swimming pool, and we're both consuming the granite countertops in the swimming pool, and we're saving for retirement at the same time, right? It's like the best sort of, it's as if you could go out to Lutes and have that be part of your 401k. Um, so to learn from that failure is to learn, is a systemic. Yeah, it's not, to don't think just of blame it the We could like, blame the bankers. Yeah, well, it's, it's not, really yeah, it's not, right. not blaming the bankers. It's saying that the actual big problems were systemic, that the problem was in the market. It was not right. in the individual banks or in the bankers. And the way that we know that is so much failed at once. We've had banks that went down before. We had, we've had Drexel, we've had, right? If it had only been one, then you would blame the bankers. Right. But, but it was like everyone in the, yeah. and also in the rest of the world. I mean, people who talk about, well, it was US deregulation. Well, then how did Spain have a housing bubble and all of these bank crashes? How are German banks in trouble? How are like, um, it's much bigger than any of this. Um, and so it, it isn't that you aren't going to find individual villains, but if you make that the focus, if we think this is primarily about individual people who, th who did things that they knew they shouldn't have done, then you don't look to the systemic risk, you don't look to the systemic cognitive biases, you don't look to all of these issues that they're still there, right? right. You don't fix them because we found the villains and we, we took care of them right. and they're bad, right? Or we didn't and all we need to do is take care of them and they're bad. Um, Some trophy villains. Like I'll get the trophy. Yeah. Trophy. What do you call trophy <laughs> kids here in a second. Uh, let's go with this. Let's talk about the children. All right. So you you Think go the there. Children. You go there. You, you do the red meat of book sales of like let's just do the next person saying that the younger generation sucks. Right. No, I'm not actually. <laughs> uh, so I, talk I, to me about the Whipple parenting and trophy kids. Yeah. So as a parent of teenagers. <laughs> so. Um, I think the metaphor for for parenting now is the the disappearance of the high monkey bars from playgrounds. Like when I was a kid, monkey bars were at least seven feet tall, which I know because they're above my dad's head and my dad is six foot seven. Um, and there was concrete under them. And I'm not saying that we should like take the mats away. I'm all, for, I'm all for mats for kids. But we took the monkey bars away, right? We cut them down until they're like three feet high so that no one can possibly fall. And what, and we've done this in all sorts of, we're, we're trying to make it so that there's no possibility of our kids falling. And I, I, this is really, I'm not saying that I blame parents, because I don't. Um, 
parents are tremendously worried about, especially upper middle class parents, tremendously worried about making sure that their kids have a guaranteed slot in the upper middle class where they are. They don't want their kids to go below their income, and that's totally understandable. Um, but the way that we're doing that is by basically everyone's supposed to go to a, a, a selective elite college. And the number of slots at those selective elite colleges has not increased since 1990 when I went there. And the demand um, for them is expanded. Demand for them has expanded a lot. Which but is a good story because the middle class and other countries are coming to our schools. That so there's the part of the part of it. Yeah, sort of walk people are moving that. around more. Right. It used to like you know my mother who was super smart and got recruited by Radcliffe but knew nothing about college went to Bucknell because it looked it was nearer where she grew up and it yeah. looked like. It's a rolling hills, Should we right? Trust she didn't adults know anything. Into 17 year olds, right? Well, my grandparents yeah. didn't know. My grandfather owned a gas station, right? right? That was, um, and so now there's much more of knowledge about it. You don't just tend to go somewhere that's near your house. You tend to go to somewhere that is, you know, suited to your needs and so forth. But the end result is that you have more and more kids trying to be crammed through the same size funnel, and so in order to keep their kids from falling out, parents are hovering more and more and more. And what you're hearing is, and I really thought that this was lies, frankly. I thought that people were just making these urban legends, but I've actually spoken to people who have been in interviews for the police force when a parent showed up, a mother showed up with her son and wanted yeah. to be there at the interview. I have spoken to manager, to, to people at business schools who say that parents are showing up to the grad school admissions interviews and wanting to sit in. Now, I don't even... Sit in? Sit in, yeah. No, they want to sit in on the interview to make sure their kid doesn't... I heard um, that on the... I, I thought I was again, in I the waiting room. In the, right now. Sit in? No, I thought this was an urban legend, but no. I talked to a business school professor who said that. Yeah, I definitely, as a parent of teenager, I definitely see that like there's a, the way my parents approach, and this is anecdotal, right? right? But the way my parents approach teen, parent have eight kids versus two, right? But it's just a, it's just a supply problem. But my parents time. had two and they didn't do yeah. this. I got into trouble with a, a So how do we fix that? What's the, what's the right solution? Because the other thing I thought about right. when, you, when I was reading it is like, yes, it is definitely parents, right? But it's also, you could argue, education system, which yes. also has a lot of incentives to simply not fail. And the parent and the teachers will say, and you're getting grade compression so that right. everyone gets a B or an A, and now it's inching towards everyone gets an Actually, A. Actually, did I tell you there's no F at my kid's high school? It's an E. <laughs> right, because if we rename it, no one will know. <laughs> right? um, kids <laughs> always know. Um, and that's the, so what, what do you do about that? I mean, I think it, it has to start with employers and with the admissions officers, because they're the ones who really perpetuate this. Like, kids starts fake charity, and admissions officers do not simply say, that is a hilarious lie. <laughs> I'm throwing your application out because you didn't start a charity. I don't believe you. Your parents did it, right? right. Um, yeah, you look at an essay, and they're clearly coached. And it's just, you know, like, I had people reading my essays and handing them back and saying, you should do that. I didn't have anyone writing my essays. There's right. just a level of, just doing the work for kids. And it doesn't serve them well in the long run. The problem is that no one feels like they can think about the long run. Yeah, and so to that end, right. And, but when is the right time to fail? Sort of like back to the baseball player, right? In that I've got a junior in high school, right? She fails this year. It really is a significant right. fork in the road for her. Um, uh, when is the right time to let a kid fail? Um, as early as possible. Right. And as, you know, part of it is challenging kids with work. If you have a kid who's gifted, the thing to do is not tell them how smart they are. The thing to do is give them stuff that they're bad at um, and let them go ahead and struggle with things. Because the thing that I certainly didn't learn at a public school where I was, I was, you know, like nine grades above in the, re literally I was reading in like the high school reader mm -hmm. when I was in fifth grade. Um, so what do you learn? You learn that it's about finding work easy. Well, that message to you is like, this is Kush. Right. right. This is and, and I can cruise from here. And, but this is the problem, right? right? Is that it's not. When you get to the real world, when you get to the big right. leagues, it's not, no one right. finds it easy. You're competing with everyone else who found it easy, too. And so, um, you know, the, the thing that you had, I had a kid come up to me who's 15, and she said, you know, this is all great um, about failing, but I'm in an IB program, and only 5% of us are going to get 4.0s. I just can't afford to take a class. I won't get an A in. Yeah. And I thought, that's insane. That is yeah, insane. How do we reward if the venture? If you can't take risks when you're 15, when is the right time going to be? Yeah, we, we, we splashed out on an edgy assisted living facility. Like, what? <laughs> it was just totally crazy. And again, like she has, I understand what her incentives are. We need to change the system. Right. As a parent, what you need to do is make sure that your child has the opportunity to take challenges. And I do think that things like, um, something you saw with the Harvard cheating scandal, which I write about in the book, and which had just shocked me. Because when I was in high school, stuff like this happened. 
was in college. But our parents were on the side of the school. There was no question that your parent was going to come into the school and be like, well, you should forgive my child for cheating, right? That just did not happen. I got into trouble with a teacher when I was a senior, and it was, she was in the wrong. And I, I ask you to accept this on faith because the administration eventually intervened on my side. Um, but my parents refused. They were like, you know, get along with authority is an important skill that you're going to need to learn later in life, so this would be a good time. Um, and they were right. But it's inconceivable now because the stakes are so high. And as long as the stakes are that high, parents are not. You see them in New York, in the private schools, ch hiring tutors to do the work for the, work for the kids. And I'm sure they would love to give their kids values. They just don't, they don't feel that they, their kids can afford to have values now. Maybe they can acquire them later at Harvard. Yeah, it's going to be too late. Uh, two other big points. Uh, the, it's, there's two conversations about failure in the, in the economy, right? A certain level of folks can afford to go to Silicon Valley, fail and fail and fail again. Uh, but a lot of folks in the economy simply can't. It's where at a one, to some degree, where it's a one failure yeah. opportunity. Like you, there are now credit checks for job publications, right? Um, if you make the wrong call and move and it's a failure, you are just on the economic margins for a long time, right? Talk about how your, the book applies to that community of folks. So I actually think when you, just when you talk about the college admissions process, this is a good example of, on the one hand, you have elite kids who are herded into college. And then on the other hand, you have poor kids who are basically like Nadia Comaneci, right? They will win if they get a perfect 10. If they don't make one mistake, they will get through college. But if they make any mistakes, there's no one there to catch them. And this is a little less true at some of the elite schools, which are really, Although really Jason DePaul's piece about the kids from, right. right, the kid made one mistake. She made one sort of a good one. Yeah. She was a little scared about something, didn't want to talk about her parents. And poof, she was gone from yeah, memory. Yeah, or she was trying to help her. Right, or right. they they uh, you know they have a relative who needs help and they right. don't understand what it's going to mean if they drop out and all of these things. There's no one there to tell them. There's no one there giving them all the this pushing and social capital the middle class kids just have. Even if your parents don't have money, even if they have problems, you just know because of sort of the environment you're in. Your so friends. What's the message here for them? Um, I think that the message. The first message is like we have to change the system. It really is. This has become completely insane. The ways in which, and I think that is generally more true um, for poor kids, poor workers, than it has been in a long time. I actually don't think the credit checks are as big a problem as people think, because employers do tend to understand. Like what they're looking for is, are you having current ongoing money problems that are going to incent yeah. you to steal from the till? But if you, if you lost your house to a short sale, they actually are. Uh, it's less dire than people think on that front, but it's more dire just in that what we're, what we're really doing is eliminating the latter, this credentialism. Right is making it, you know, my grandfather worked as a grocery boy until he was 26 and became a successful small businessman. When I was in IT, we had, like, some of the best people who were IT consultants were just random. The best guy I knew was a, uh, a, a religious studies major. Yeah, Google was pulled out. It used to be right. just like eight years ago, if you, you had to have, you, they were looking for your high school, yeah. high school transcript, your GPA, your SAT scores, your total. I looked at your college transcript. Whereas like and that's one, guy, one guy who was one of our best guys on, on Cisco routers and, and that sort of equipment, he had been a porter at one of the buildings that my company consulted in. And they had eventually hired him to run cable because as, as one of my bosses said, if you want to run cable for the first six months, all you need to do is breathe and carry a tool bag. Um, and he worked his way up. And those things, even in IT, which was very, when I was in the 90s, was very much like that. Just all these random people who had been like the air conditioning repair guy at an office and had somehow ended up running their network. There was a ton of that around. And a lot of those people were great and were closing in industry after industry. You see this closing down, closing down um, because of the computer sorting of resumes is just easier to select for degrees. So, so that, that, that's still my libertarian friend. Right. So that's the. Uh, I don't have a regulatory solution for this because the government's also even worse about like right. Like, I don't talk about talk about the, right exactly. That, that, go there, but the, on this one point, right? The, the risk you. of that the, the you could argue that this credentialing is a natural reaction of the elite to make sure that they don't leave the elite because they're the only ones who can afford the credential. Right? Uh, I think that that is definitely part of it. Um, I do. I mean, I think right. that the. Like, and I think it may work from the other end, is like if everyone now has a BA and you look around the job market, your kid's having trouble advancing, you encourage them to go to grad school, maybe you help finance their right. going to grad school, and then suddenly all the elite kids have grad degrees. And right, the inflation of degrees, right. right. It's the degree inflation. 
Um, but you push that not elite kid even farther and farther out. Yeah, exactly. The college degree is far enough away. Heck, I, don't, I can't get a master's degree. No yeah, way. and I, I think that this, I think that the system's completely insane. How do you handle it? But I don't think that there's no opportunity at the bottom. There are mm. amazing stories of people who start with very little and just hustle. Um, it's just harder, and it's getting harder. The capital requirements are getting higher and so forth. So how do you do it? I mean, the, the, the first thing, and I, I talk about this in the labor market chapter, um, you know, like how you do job search matters, but it doesn't matter as much as um, just doing it and just being out there. And it's terrible because when you do job search, you're basically saying, hey, do you want to reject me? And people are like, yes, I would love yeah. to reject you, right? Most people say no. Most people stop with the first job. Well, that's the get. end set. That, that's, a, that's a positive end set feature, right? That right? You just keep putting yourself out there. Sooner or later, something Sooner good Sooner or happen. later, it's a, lot, it's a numbers game. It's like dating. Right. You know, you, you, well, I mean, you look, at, yeah. you look at people who are dating kind of out of their league. <laughs> and all of them are basically the same way, which is they just ask so many people out right. that eventually someone who's kind of above the average says yes, and then they stick with that person. Wow. Um, it really, it, like, a lot of this stuff really is a numbers game. The problem is that it's really, really difficult. I mean, like, have you I mean, found I, I want to meet that kid who's got the hoodspots. Like, just keeps going. I, I am a, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, this is anecdotal. I have not actually, I don't think there is any actual research on this. This is my observation, is in the rare cases where I meet someone who's just clearly, like, um, you know, dating someone who is way more attractive than they are. Uh, it is usually because that is someone who just, and is not fantastically wealthy and flying them around. And the inverse probably the, the, the person above their league just hasn't put themselves out there. And so right. They're, they're and it's the, like a lot of it really is just being willing to consistently risk rejection and try something even at the risk of failure. And that is true at the bottom, at the top. The, you know, the thing that you have to do then is plan so that it's not an unrecoverable failure, right? Like, Crime is not a good risk. Right. It's uh, you may get very wealthy, but the the downside is large and it's almost impossible to recover from. Two more tough points on that is the uh, is the story of Tyson's, which is sort of big here in America because Chris Lund just wrote his big book, The Meat Racket, about how Tyson's has vertically integrated itself as a essentially a monopoly, behaving like that, and has insulated itself from risk of failure at the expense of the farmer. Right. The the, right. the, the pain as, as us on us as eaters is sort of. He argues there's, there's higher prices, but it's a little more diluted than it is clear to the person who owns a chicken farm that the risk of failure is, is now on them and not, how do you solve that problem? And how, and how do you t message to the farmer that this is somehow part of the game, part of the deal? Well, I mean, you see farmers solving that problem by going outside of the Tyson system, right? right? I mean, I, I buy my meat from, uh, or a lot of my meat, not all of my meat, but we subscribe to a meat CSA. Right. And it is a little pricier, but the meat's way better. Um, and the farmers who are in it are much more, I mean, farming has always been really risky. I come from a, a long line of farmers, almost all of whom are out of it now, right. because they can't use, it's the capital investment is huge and the risk is always on the farmer because it's about weather and okay. all of that sort of thing. Um, but the big food processors have made it tougher in a lot of ways. And they've, they've taken a lot of the joy out of farming as well. It's like it's much more like being a cog in an industrial machine than yeah. it is about. Um, and how do you, how do you respond? At, you know, exit is usually, and, and I think- And all of us exiting too from the- Yeah, from the and all of us exiting on the other side because I, mean, I, I believe very strongly in, um, I'm not against eating meat, but I don't think that you should unnecessarily make the animal suffer to save a small amount of money on the amount, like I would rather right. eat a little bit less meat. Or make a farmer suffer. Right, exactly, and know that the farmer and the, um, and it, obviously this is personal because I'm not yeah. telling a welfare mother who's trying to string along right, what right. she has, but for me, uh, you know, we make enough money that I would rather pay extra for my meat and eggs, eat a little less of it, and know that the farmer and the animals were treated well in the process, which is not the case in most industrialized. I do want to talk about mechanics, and maybe we'll get to it, but I want to get to audience questions, so I have one more question for me. Is the, having seen failure coming in my life, right? It's March of year X, and I know December is the precipice. The funding for this project will run out. <coughs> my decision-making for that nine months was clouded by the adrenaline, right, overflow of my brain, like, holy crap, you, and, uh, and then the, immediate plan B, like I'm distracted by the safety net, but the life's, right. how do you, if you encourage folks to fail, and either for, what, for whatever reasons, their ego or their financial uh, precipice that they're on, how do they behave in those later stages of failure? And how do they keep going at it? Part of it is having a plan B, and so the story I tell at the end of the book is when my husband and I, both my husband and I are journalists, which is, as I believe I mentioned at the beginning, not the most stable 
or uncompetitive. Now. Never was and definitely isn't now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember talking to a guy at the LA Times who was saying when he finally got a job there, I think in the early 90s, he remembered calling his brother and saying, and the best part is I will never have to look for another job again. Oh. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, so what we did when we bought our house was we looked at, and we were a little bit lucky because we were, we were buying in 2010 when house prices in DC were a lot lower than they are now. Um, but we, we went into a neighborhood that all of our friends thought was way too far east. And you know, there were no services there. Our grocery store opened up like, I don't know, five months after we bought the house. Um, but before that, there was no grocery store within even reasonable, like even arguable walking distance and so forth. Um, and we said to ourselves, what if we lost our jobs? What if we both lost our jobs and we both had to take jobs that paid half of what we pay now, of what we make now? How much mortgage could we afford? And that was as much house as we were willing to buy. Right. And um, it meant that our house is smaller and, and it was in a s various states of disrepair and so forth. We've slowly rectified that. But we rectify that with cash, like our fixed expenses we keep low. Because that makes for less panic. But that's a risk aversion. Like you're, you're not. Sure. I and mean, that's a different kind of failure. You don't want to fail, but not right. that. But in so terms of career or. What you want to take, what you want to do is think about those things like the fixed consumption decisions that allow you to take more risks in your career. Oh, okay. And so these are, you know, like taking a big risk on buying a house, what's the upside to that? Well, I have a nice big house, but I can right. lose it. Um, minimizing my house so that I have more career options. And I'm more comfortable and I'm not freaking out all the time. I'm not freaking out all the time. I mean, right. really, like, I sleep so well at night because right. our mortgage is less than 20% of our take home. And just, like, and I pay it down extra every month. And just, like, the warm cozies that that yeah. gives me is, is we can envision a day when we'll have no mortgage and we'll have paid off our mortgage within 10 or 15 years. And, you know, at that point, your monthly nut goes really, really low. Right. That's a great feeling. And so it isn't that you just, you want to fill out everything. You want to fill out the stuff where there's real growth and opportunity. And so you minimize the stuff, you try to minimize things like your financial run rate in order to, burn rate rather, um, in order to maximize the flexibility that you have to take on other sorts of challenges Don't and other the sorts stuff, of risks. Risk stuff. Yeah, and, but we tend to do the opposite, right? Like right. Everyone, everyone tells you buy as much house as you can afford. I think, I think that lesson is dialed back a little bit, <laughs> but I'm still, of, yeah. when, I, when we bought our house, I remember I got on the phone with the bank, we didn't even use my husband's income because we had just gotten married and we we're like, it'll probably just be simpler if we yeah. just, you know, we, as it turned out, we had to give them all our marriage documents anyway. But yeah. um, so I'm on the phone and, I get, and I'm walking around and I'm pacing and finally she's like, well, you know, I think all you're going to be able to borrow is, and she named a figure that was like five times my annual income. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and so I finally hung up and my husband was like, we're not going to get the house. I was like, no, we could buy two. Yeah. It was really, and that was my, my staid little conservative. A, I, had, I hate that moment because they, it's almost like the built in to make you go for, oh, I can do all this. Yeah, exactly. I can do all this and put myself at great risk. But then I think yeah. about having that actual house payment. It makes me want to vomit. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, but like the, all of the incentives and the way that people tend to, to think about it is they buy as much house as they can possibly afford. They do as much of that. And then they can't switch jobs because they're locked into this very, very high fixed. You want to minimize the, the fixed, Thing, risks that you're taking where you really can't get out of them and mm -hmm. maximize the, the things the that adventure. you can recover from. We'll go audience questions, and I'm not looking at my phone because I'm bored of your questions. I'm seeing if anybody's anything on Twitter, but let's go to the audience questions first and take a second for the microphone to come to you. Thank you. Oh, hi. My name's Dan Kahn. I'm actually a management consultant at the moment. Um, you talked a lot about issues affecting kind of policy and big picture things, but I'm actually interested in hearing about how it affects management because those resume screeners, I don't see it at all having to do with the elites. I have it, I, I see it as having to do with the incentives for any HR manager if they hire somebody who has a BA from Maryland and they can't do the job, nothing bad's going to happen to them. If they hire the guy off the street who seemed really smart and like he could be a good IT guy and he steals money or just doesn't work out they are potentially putting their job on the line. So how do you think about the stuff that you write about in your book and how it translates into American management style? Um, I think that this is part of a broader process. And you've seen it in all countries, but America did, in, in a lot of ways, somewhat less of it and is doing a lot more of it. Um, and I do think that the, the, the way that we apply for jobs has actually changed a lot with these resume screeners and so forth, is that um, a good way to think about this is the government. 
we've taken all the discretion away from government bureaucrats because we don't want them to ever make a mistake, right? We can't fire them, so since we have no way to punish them for doing anything wrong, instead we just make sure they can't do anything wrong and we hamstring them so thoroughly that when I, I was talking to a guy who went to be a, a, a state official in the South and he had been a banker before, so his first day, He's pretty senior. And he says, okay, well, he tells the secretary, okay, get some sandwiches. We're going to sit down in the lunchroom and talk to the team. She's like, oh, no, we can't do that. We can't buy sandwiches on, on, on the government dime unless they're having overtime. Like, that's insane, right? It, the odds that, that government employees are going to get away with surplus sandwiches, we spend more time pursuing this. It would be cheaper just to buy the damn sandwiches, even if they were profligately eating sandwiches all the time. Um, and there's a similar thing in, in companies now. As they've gotten bigger, and for a lot of legal reasons, because it isn't just about the incentive for the manager, it's about legal, a lot of legal safe harbor. They've gotten more and more rigid about rules and processes, because when you can document a process, you're, you have safe harbor from lawsuit. And so you see this, for example, with anti-discrimination stuff, right? And I'm not, I'm not in any way saying we like <laughs> I'm pro-discrimination or against anti-discrimination laws, but what you, the way that this has worked out in the American legal system um, is a little bit crazy in that what people do is spend an enormous amount of time documenting that they have a process that is not designed to discriminate. And then they still may have no underrepresented minorities, but as long as they've got a good process, right, we can. They're, pre they're um, preventing it's a huge failure at the expense yeah, of the ability so like, to fail all the time. Yeah, so like they, they prevent the lawsuit, but it doesn't actually fix the problem. And also what it does is lock in this giant HR apparatus, which then does things like throwing out all of the resumes from people who don't have a BA. And like what group is most likely to, to come in with a BA from Maryland is like the same group that was there before, right? We haven't actually rectified the discrimination. What we've done is document that we're not deliberately discriminating. And that's, um, so, but it's not just that. I mean, it's every kind of lawsuit. It's unfair, you know, unfair firings and so forth. And again, it's not that the, the, any of these things are necessarily bad. That it's that the way that the American legal system handles them in particular has caused this enormous pressure to bureaucratize and to document and to document. So in large companies, the ability to do what even IBM and those big companies would have done 50 years ago, which is take a chance on a kid from the assembly line or whatever and move them up, managers had a lot more discretion and they're losing that discretion. We're running it through these systems that are capable of documenting them for the legal system. I think it's a big problem. I don't know what individuals can do. I think that the hope is in small companies which do a lot less of this and which still do have a lot more room to, um, to, to rely more on personal um, evaluations than what the computer thinks about your resume. Thank you. Uh, Abraham Avidor, retired foreign service. Um, to cope with these many failures in life, uh, business, uh, social politics. Uh, President Lincoln coined the expression, I'm too old to cry, but it hurts too much to laugh. Uh, what do you think about it from the standpoint of being humoristic and uh, living above it and coping with failures? It's hugely necessary. Um, so I talk about some of my personal uh, you know, best slash worst moments. Um, and the funny thing is when I tell them as stories, I tell these stories fairly frequently about how, for example, um, when I was 33, the man that I was living with indicated on Wednesday that he was ready to get married, and then on Saturday he told me he'd made a huge mistake and I should move out. Um, and that was really traumatic. And I responded to that trauma by, among other things, just watching television nonstop. And I couldn't watch anything happy because that made me sad, and I also couldn't watch anything sad because that made me sad, so I just watched the Science Channel for like months on end. And I can tell this story and be funny about it, but, the, but when I went back and started writing this out and I had to really describe it and not just be funny, it, it still hurt. It still hurt a lot. Like all of the stuff that happened, it really does hurt, but when you, can, when you can see the funny side of it, when you see the funny side of the fact that there was this commercial for Daisy sour cream that I still hear as like the saddest and most mournful sound, this jingle, because I heard it over and over again when I was in like the worst sadness of my life, um, the, it's phenomenally necessary to, f to look at the, uh, Robert Heinlein, who's a science fiction writer, says that ultimately laughter and jokes are a way of sharing pain. And that we think of them as a way of sharing joy, but when you think about the source of a, of a joke, it's always something bad happening to someone who didn't think it was funny. 
Um, and being able to see that that's being able to laugh about it is a way of, of sharing your pain with other people and making it okay. I have to pro project myself in the middle of a problem. Like, how will I feel about this in 10 years? I'm sitting over talking. Yeah. Will it still be painful or will it be something that I think I can learn from? Well, I also find, and I, I know a lot of people <coughs> have already heard this, but you know, when you're really worried about something bad happening, because uh, writing a book about failure does not mean that you just stop you're like, oh, okay, well, great, I'll lose my job, we'll be homeless. Um, you're not, you don't, you still worry about stuff. Um, you just worry less and maybe more constructively. Um, and one of the th things that's really helpful is just to think, okay, what, what's the absolute worst thing that can happen? Because it's usual that your dread is of some unnamed thing that is far worse than any reasonable thing that could come, right? right? Um, Assign probability. Of yeah, no, thing, like yeah. you start thinking, well, obviously this is going to go wrong and then, well, and then I'll get fired and then you're like, do companies really fire people for forgetting to like, you know, check out the proper office supply procedure when ordering pens or whatever it is? Right now, <laughs> you go and you're like, I don't know, I didn't do this right, fix it. And they're like, oh, and they sort of give you a bad look and that's it. the end. But you tend to worry more than things warrant. And like in some ways that's good, right? Because you prevent failures. Right. But uh, it's also like you then spend so much, I used to think that doing that would like prophylactically um, make it hurt less when it happened. And then with that relationship, I found out this is completely <laughs> untrue. I was so miserable. And like all of the worrying I had done for 18 months or two years before that made it hurt not one way less. So like my grandmother used to say, never borrow trouble, the interest rate's too high. Yeah. Any other questions in the audience? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm your mother's age. And, uh, I, <laughs> I worked um, for many years in one of the top independent schools here. And when I came in the 70s, the parents wanted their kids to be well adjusted and happy. When I left a uh, few years ago, uh, in the last 20 years, they had been desperate for their children to get into Ivy League schools, and they couldn't bear their child getting anything less than an A. They would confront teachers, they would, the whole thing, you know, you've, you've, you've commented on it. My question is, can these children how will they? How are they going to deal with risk taking uh, when they go out in the real world, or how are they dealing right. with uh, risk taking? Well, I'll you answer the question. I have a, I have a so, theory I mean, about that dynamic. But. Yeah, there's. I do think I was really skeptical when people started talking about trophy kids because, in general, right, like people my age have been complaining about how the kids these days are no good. And for they a did long for the time. boomers. And they did for the younger. Right. They've always done. Um, and thing. in fact, I think my observation, my personal observation of millennials, they work a lot harder than my generation did. We were properly known as the slacker generation. That's um, the to, to the point. I, I have this, like, this sad experience of watching my daughter work about as hard as I did, and her opportunity for the elite schools is. Right. It's not there, just even though I I, I, I nearly flunked out of high school. Yeah. I then uh, got into an Ivy League school and nearly flunked out of that. I mean, I did eventually get my life right. together. Uh, but then I got into, I got into Chicago on, with a 2.93 GPA from Penn, which would have just been inconceivable now. Um, and it, was, it would have been inconceivable at a B minus average in high school. And the idea of Penn admitting anyone like that now is just ridiculous. Which, which goes happen. to the why the parents are freaking out. Right. That, that back in the 70s, you could go for a well just a kid and they could walk into Northwestern or Harvard. They just can't now. I understand. Yeah. That, but Sorry. Yeah. So what, what employers say, and so uh, there was an entrepreneur at the, at the New America yeah. event in New York who was great and he said that like, he basically said the same thing. Because I've, I've heard from people who've, like you, who've watched multiple generations, who have actually seen, who've managed not just gen the millennials but Generation X and even people older and they do say, they're so risk averse. They expect this incredible amount of structure. Everything is supposed to be like school. Every six months you get a review and a promotion, right? And that- Well, it's then also the helicopter parenting too. Right. The anxiety disorders are up because once you take away the parent who has solved every problem that ever came up. Yeah, right. and so they're like, when they're thrust into a workplace where there's a phenomenal amount of ambiguity, and this is why, you know, one of the reasons I think that consulting and finance are so popular, right? They replicate the kind of structure of school where you, you're on a team, everyone is a super smart person who went to a school like yours. You're doing almost all kind of analytic, analytic cognitive load work. Um, and every two years it's up or out, right? There's these, these very well-defined, at least in the, you know, when I got out of business school, this was how it worked. It has been a while. Um, but th that's really appealing if you're someone who's really good at school and who has been really good at going through this system. It's very appealing to just keep 
it's, it's an easy process. And this is why everyone, all the MBAs go into consulting or finance, right? They come on campus. You don't have to go out and like figure out where to go and who to send a resume to and all of that. Um, just that as time has gone on, what, the, what even the entrepreneur was saying is that the tolerance for ambiguity and like you figure it out is dropping. They work really, really, really hard, way harder than my generation did. Um, and they have a lot of tolerance for doing what authority tells them. They have very little tolerance for when authority is like, I don't know, figure it out, do something. We don't know what's going to work. Go do it. Go sell this. Go like. Um, and I, it's not just elite kids, by the way. I also heard this from a car rental manager in the Midwest who said, you know, the kids who are five years younger than the kids, there's like someone flipped a switch. Somewhere in that time between 23 and 28. It would now be well to the point of your book. Is that because the risk of failure is greater, or the perception of risk because of failure is greater? Because it's because our what we're looking for is a guarantee, and having why? gone why because there is there, there's more variance in the it's true the premium to a degree has gone up, okay. and that but that in turn is because HR managers are looking for a guarantee, right? right? They want we're all looking we're all trying to to find these guarantees, and what it, what that is doing is is forcing large numbers of people onto the economic sidelines. I have one more question. Yeah, oh, we have two, so we'll go ahead and go two. Right, my name is Rolf, I work at the Swedish Embassy. Could you just tell us a few words about your thoughts about how I do regard my risk taking or an individual's risk taking? I'm thinking specifically about sort of entrepreneurship and innovation, and if you're in the position, for example, of a, um, of a venture capitalist about to possibly fund a, uh, a innovative product uh, development or something like that, um, or the situation when you can uh, actually say that you have taken large risks and possibly have failed, but nevertheless you can make that convincing argument to such a venture capitalist, for example? Well, I mean, what venture capitalists do is really smart, which is that they diversify. You take big risks, but you take enough of them that if 30% of them pay off, they fund the ones that failed, right? You're, it's a high risk, high reward strategy. Um, and from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I mean, this is why, not I think not wrongly, you tend to see entrepreneurs being under 50, right? At some point, the risk reward, if you're 57 and you say, well, this could make me really, really rich in 30 years, like, okay, I'm going to have the best upholstered nursing home room. And, Although I will um, say, I've, I've noticed that people my age, I'm in my late 40s, right? It's because of life expectancy now. Yeah. Men my age can now go, they can go for the 2.0 because they, yeah. there's, there's more opportunity sort of let that play out in the out years. No, no, there is. I mean, that, that definitely years. helps. Right. But yeah, I mean, you just see in older societies and in right. older people, risk risk tolerance drops pretty much rationally. Um, the payoff matrix just changes. So part of it, I mean, like part of the thing I really worry about for all of Europe, America, uh, somewhat less, but still a big issue, China and so forth, is just that as society ages, your tolerance for risk taking just naturally falls. And that is going to make, a, I think, a big difference in how entrepreneurial uh, our societies are going forward and something not a lot of people have been talking about. Um, you know, how do, they, how do they assess it? It's always a little bit more of an art than a science. You talk to VCs and they're like, well, I mean, there's a threshold effect, right? Stuff that's just obviously stupid gets thrown out. But after that, they know they are, they're going to have a high failure rate. No matter what they do, maybe Kleiner or Perkins can just guarantee that anyone they fund is going to. But in general, they know that they're going to have a lot of misses. It's kind of like a baseball player here, right? A, a, a good baseball player is a guy who strikes out seven out of ten times he gets out of, up to the bat. It's the other three that make him a great. The other three times that make him a great baseball player. One last question. What implications um, does this have for policymakers? Are there circumstances where you could see government even promoting or encouraging risk? to the point of failure or the imp uh, implications on the safety net, what do you recommend? Uh, I talk a lot about that because I'm, you know, I'm fundamentally a policy writer. Uh, so one thing I think America is really good at and uh, really undervalued is bankruptcy is that uh, we have a little, neat little natural experiment in America, uh, which is that bankruptcy law is federal, but the exemptions that you can shield from creditors are at the state level. And so more generous, states with more generous exemptions have more entrepreneurship. Um, and it makes sense for two reasons. First of all, there's the perspective. It's easier to take a risk if you know that your wife and children are still going to be housed. I'm speaking in a gender. There are lots of female entrepreneurs, but most of the people. Well, I'm going to keep going. And uh, 
and similar, but also like the recovery. So one of the things that I talk about in my book, uh, Europeans think our bankruptcy laws are crazy. It's really funny because you, you would think that like mean America, which has no safety net, would also have mean bankruptcy laws, but it's the opposite. Um, indeed, a, I was interviewing an expert uh, on a completely different topic, and just in the middle of this interview, was interviewing about Russia, he just started making fun of our bankruptcy laws. He was like, you can just walk into a judge and be like, I can't pay, and the judge is like, okay, don't. <laughs> and you, go, you just thought that was totally insane, and this guy was Scandinavian, he was, you know, it was not, um, but I actually looked at a, a Danish entrepreneur who has been stuck with debt that he incurred in 2001 because uh, during the recession and after 9-11, he had to lay a bunch of people off. And in Denmark, it was very generous layoff terms um, meant that he had to pay everyone severance, which meant he had to take on a lot of debt to do that. And because his business, he couldn't, with all of this debt hanging over him, couldn't get back on his feet. Now, in America, this guy would have declared bankruptcy five, ten years ago and just reorganized it, gotten on a payment plan that he could afford, and started growing his business again. But he can't do it because he cannot declare bankruptcy. Um, he, can't, he can't access the protection unless his creditors sign off. And that actually turns out to be really important. So that's, I mean, that's one, why is bankruptcy a good safety net though? Because I actually think this is really instructive and it, it speaks to a lot of different kinds of safety nets because the safety net can be really powerful in helping people fail well, but it can also be really terrible and cause them to get stuck in their failure. So bankruptcy encourages people to move on, for one thing. In America, it's the, the structure, it's called the, the fresh start. So um, the idea is that unlike other places where bankruptcy is mostly about the creditors, and this is changing, people have looked at our, our very debtor-friendly laws and are moving in that direction in both corporate reorganization and, and personal bankruptcy, which I think is a great sign. Uh, sadly, we have decided, we in 2005 decided to move in the other direction for reasons that I'm still. Um, so the fresh start's really important. It's about helping someone say, okay, that happened, it didn't work, that chapter is now closed, and we are all going to move forward. Um, second thing, it hurts. Bankruptcy is not fun. It's not, it doesn't hurt for any reason, right? Like, I thought when I, I went to bankruptcy court, actually, I spent a week in Memphis, and I thought when I went down there that it would just be sobbing mothers and so forth. Um, it, you can't even believe how much nothing bankruptcy court is. It's like traffic court. Like, you go in and you just, you're like, I can't pay, and the judge is like, okay, go see, like, stamp, move on. It, it's really, really, um, a lot of times the creditors aren't even, the debtors aren't even there. It's just two lawyers arguing. For a big bankruptcy, it's just two lawyers sit there and argue about, like, exactly who's going to get what. Um, but it's really boring. Um, I'd been really totally expecting, like, L.A. law and all this drama. No drama. Um, but people are ashamed of it. And I actually don't think that's a bad balance. Our bankruptcy law is really easy, in part because most people who could benefit don't abuse it. You could just run up a bunch of debt and then bankrupt it and get away with that, right? I mean, you have a mark on your, uh, on your credit record, but you could have a lot of fun before you did that. Almost no one does that. I'm not saying no one because there's always some jerk who will do any stupid thing you can imagine with any government program you can imagine, but most people don't. Most people get into bankruptcy trouble. People who did basically reasonable things, maybe they spent too much money, but you know what? Like, I know a lot of people who are one bad job loss away from where a lot of the people I saw in bankruptcy court were. Like the problem is not, it, a lot of Americans live up to the edge of their income. Um, and the statistics back that up. So there's shame on it and people will struggle to pay their debt and then when, when they really can't, I'm just like, okay, done. I think it's a really good compromise that we found. And I, I, like, I really don't wanna mess with it on either side. I don't want people, I, I was against the kind of, oh, just mail your keys to the bank but I was also against the 2005 bankruptcy reform. Using the cultural weight to support this important institution is really good. Um, so it hurts, but the, the pain is a very specific kind. It is not crippling. What happened to that Danish entrepreneur that I interviewed is crippling. It is, I cannot move on, I could lose my house, I'm constantly in fear of this. What happens to someone who declares bankruptcy in America is it's short, it's sharp, and then it's over. And yes, you'll always know you declared bankruptcy, you're never gonna feel good about it, but it's over, you can move on. Uh, so Dave Ramsey is a great example, evangelical personal finance guru, one of the most successful talk radio programs in the country, declared bankruptcy. And now makes his living telling people how not to do this by doing, <laughs> minimizing their debt and so forth. Um, and he paid all that money back. And he tells people to stay out of bankruptcy, and I think he's right about that. You shouldn't declare unless you have to. Um, 
but also bankruptcy was what enabled him to get enough breathing room, right? So he was also against the 2005 bankruptcy reform. It's that, like, it's the balance of, on the personal side, try to stay out of it, but on the institutional side, once it's happened, we say, okay, move on. Because the payment plans don't work that often. So Memphis is the bankruptcy capital of the world, uh, which we know because the U.S. is the bankruptcy capital of the world and Memphis is our bankruptcy capital. Like 1% of people in Memphis declare bankruptcy every year. But a lot of the reason for that is their own payment plans. And the payment plans just keep failing and they keep refiling. And the creditors are happy with that, actually, by the way. So I asked about that because they were supposed to have been banned in 2005. And the judge was like, no one's complaining. Creditors are very happy to have them in a payment plan and not have to be chasing them down and garnishing their wages. Um, but these, these, the payment plans just tend to fail. They're very hard to stay on. Whereas when you've got it over and you can move on, you have clarity. And predictability and clarity are really good places to be when you're starting over. Um, and so I think about this with like, un uh, uh, I know it's been really long, so I'm gonna, but think about this with unemployment. So bad unemployment policy, uh, something like you used to see in a lot of European countries, seeing some still. Uh, you were a steel worker, your steel plant closed, okay, I'm gonna pay 90% of your wages, well you just look for another job as a steel worker. Now, having been long-term unemployed, I'm very sympathetic with that steel worker. He's probably facing a reduction in wages, he's accumulated a lot of human capital doing what he did, he might have to take a job he doesn't like as much, et cetera, et cetera. Also, job search is really painful, but you're enabling that person to make a, a, good, a rational short-term decision that is a very bad long-term decision, because what we know from studies, again, of Europe with high replacement rates is that unemployed people are not happy. They're socially disconnected, they're disconnected from the labor market, it's a permanent, you are unhappy as long as you don't have a job. So by helping someone to not look for work, and to scar, what they call labor scarring, which is the longer you've been out of work, the harder it is to get someone to employ you at anything. Um, you're helping them to make a bad decision. So you shouldn't have a policy like that. On the other hand, look at something like Denmark, which says, okay, we're gonna have a high replacement rate, but you have to be training for something else. We're not gonna have a high replacement rate while you try to be a steel worker. That's one way you could go. Is, you know, in America, there are things that, we, we certainly could have had something like the WPA, where you employ people on a short-term basis. You could have pegged the program to the unemployment rate. So long-term unemployment benefits that are just simply that seem to have a bad impact. But there are things you can do, have people do a WPA-style program where there's work involved, it's reciprocal, which sort of bolsters your political support. We get something out of it. And also, there's no incentive to stay on it and not go find a, a regular job if you can. We could have had a payroll tax rebate. One month, we'll, give, we'll rebate the whole payroll tax one month for every month this person's been out of work. We could have been basically offering a wage subsidy to hire the long-term unemployed. What we should think about is not just making unemployment not hurt, but making the pain not catastrophic and making it about, okay, how do we move on as quickly as possible? How do we get back into the labor market, stay connected to the labor market instead of paying people to stay out of it? And we tend to cast it instead of this moral hazard play of either people are these helpless victims who we need to make whole, or people are terrible abusers who are just gonna like, stay on unemployment because they love not working. And again, there are people like that, I have met them, but they're not the majority. The majority are people who are struggling with something really difficult. We should be focusing on how do we help them to make better decisions, to keep them focused on the future and connected to the labor market. And we didn't do that, and I think it was a big missed opportunity. One last one, does Obamacare help people take more risks by leaving jobs they shouldn't be in because they're worried about insurance. The I, know job like, I know how you yeah. feel about the ACA, so I'll make sure I get <laughs> yeah, the job it. Like, I'm really interested in this. I can't wait to see it because this year we're going to get data. If job lock is a big problem, then yeah. in 2014, we should see a massive, massive noticeable increase right. in entrepreneurship. We don't know, like there's a little bit, the economy's improving, so it's going to be a little hard to tease out, but I think that we should see that. Um, there's a few reasons to be skeptical. The first is that if you have a real problem that makes it hard to get health insurance, that also tends to make you not want to leave your job. So if you have a special needs kid, right? right? I'm thinking more about I don't want to leave insurance, period. Without, right, uh, yeah. but if I, you have a special needs kid, right? right? I'm worried about being an entrepreneur because, yeah. right? That's really well, weird. if you have a special needs kid, probably also needs a lot of money for ancillary stuff that insurance right. doesn't cover. Can I really afford to leave my job? Can I afford to leave my job where they understand that sometimes I just got to leave work in the middle of the day? Like right. all of that stuff. Entrepreneurs work, you know, 18 hours a day. Right. It, so it tends to be what, what uh, social scientists call overdetermined, <laughs> is that the problem of job lock with people who have trouble getting insurance, trouble getting health insurance, there are so many other things going on there that would also make them reluctant to leave their jobs that I don't know. We will see this year. 
Um, I would love to find out that that's the case, but uh, we don't see it. One thing that makes me skeptical is that countries with more generous social safety nets in general do not have higher rates of entrepreneurship in the US, which is what I would expect to see if right. that were a real factor. Cool. Megan McArdle, thank you very much. Upside it down.